Thanks for joining us for season three of the Stories Unveiled podcast. Stories Unveiled exists to create a platform for people to share hope through their personal stories of what Jesus does in their life. Each episode highlights a different guest, just like you and I, wading through this life that can get so messy. I hope this conversation proves helpful and encourages you to go live unveiled. Today, my friend Scott McMenamin is joining me in the studio. I met Scott just a few short months ago, and he has become so dear to my family. He is a gentle giant with a heart for serving men in his community. Scott has an incredible story of God's goodness in his life, so I hope you enjoy our conversation. Scott, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay, I want to start by chatting about how we met. How did you and I get connected? Um, I met, I think we met because of your husband. I had a conversation with your husband. Yeah. And I put the pieces together that you were the Ashley that was on the radio. <laughs> and I had this celebrity crush about this <laughs> podcast yeah. thing that you did. And yeah. I loved it and didn't think it was initially for me. And, but I continued to listen because I was gleaning something from every episode that everything that somebody, something was said in every episode yeah. that touched my heart. I love that. So. And you met my husband at a men's retreat. A men's retreat. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Through our church. So we go to church together. Yes. And you and Asher um, went to the men's retreat and met. And I remember my husband came home and he was like, he met a bunch of men on that trip. And he came home and he was like, he referred to as Boston Scott. Yes. That's my nickname. <laughs> Boston Scott. Because you're from Boston. Yes. Um, and so he was like, man, I met this guy named Scott. He's from Boston. He's this, He's really, really tall. How tall are you? Six, six. Yeah, that's really tall. <laughs> um, and he was like, you know, he's so awesome. And then I can't remember if it was then or what happened, but then he put... He told me that you put the puzzle pieces together and I met you. And um, did you listen to me in my husband's podcast episode? Yes. You did? I did. So at what point did you realize that was him? Um, I, I think I realized it before that. Okay. When I found out who you were and we met, I think he it may have introduced us on a Sunday. Yeah. That's when I started becoming a fervent listener. I listened. I, listen, <laughs> I kind of binge, binge listen. I drive a truck during yeah. the day, so I kind of binge listen. Yeah. So. Oh, it's a great place to listen to it. My husband does the same thing. Yeah. When he's turning tools, he's plugged in listening yeah. to all the podcasts. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And it actually makes me really happy that regardless of if it's a man or a woman as a guest, that that you glean something from it because everybody has a story. So yes. awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So talk to me. You grew up in Boston? I did. I was born and raised in Boston. Okay. Um, I lived in Boston all the way through my college years. Okay. So, so tell me about what life was like in Boston and your family. Um, I didn't have the atypical family upbringing. Um, my mom was sick. Very, when I was very young, mm -hmm. and I ended up losing my mom at 10 oh. to cancer. She had um, breast cancer that progressed to other stuff. That um, So I lost her at 10, and for all intensive purposes, I lost my dad on the same day. Although my dad didn't die, I lost the emotional connection to that man, yeah. my dad. So, But my mom was the instrumental person reason why I found church. Really? Um, so before the first 10 years of your life. Yes. I do remember one of the most vivid memories I have is walking to church with her one time. And this was when some of the soldiers were coming back from Vietnam. Okay. And there was a Vietnam um, veteran who had lost a limb, lost a leg. Wow. And I laughed at him. And she back, good old Italian mom, smacked me side, right up the side of my head with her cane. Oh, no. So um, I learned not to laugh at different people yeah. in, a, in a real way. Yeah. But beyond that, she used to walk to church with me. We used to go to church on Sundays. Yeah. I was raised in the Catholic faith. Okay. So, um, and it was just, it touched my heart immediately. Like, mm -hmm. gosh, there was something about that experience, that connection at, in church that, I owe, I owe the I owe, owe it to God that that's why He put my mom in my life for that short oh. amount of time. So. I'm so sorry that you lost your mom. Yeah. Yes. So, you lost your mom. You 
effectively lost your dad because he yeah. kind of emotionally detached, right? Yeah. And, and he was, um, he became very angry. He was yeah. a very angry and abusive dad. He, most forms of abuse. I mean, he wasn't mm. sexually abusive, but yeah. gosh, there was other forms of physical and emotional yeah. abuse that was, that, yeah, it was pretty rough. He didn't know how to deal with his anger no, he did and bitterness. Not. No, I think he was angry that he had to raise the three boys because I have two brothers. Okay. That, uh, well, I'm, I have one brother left. I've lost a brother two years ago to cancer. Mm. So, yeah. So he had he had a rough time with it. Yeah. So, so what did the rest of like from you know ten to your college years like what did that look like? I mean, were you like raising yourself? Were you and your brothers kind of? Uh, no. Uh, my mom had a sister Rose that okay. was very um, hands on in helping raise not only her family but oh. she helped raise us boys because Dad still had to work and mm -hmm. do all those kind of things. So she was very instrumental in that. Okay. And um, I did grow up right in the streets of Boston. Wow. And not in a bad way, but because I, I turned to sports. Okay. But sports that we played in, in the city were not on fields like they have. Concrete and, jungle? Yeah. It was literally <laughs> concrete jungles with somebody's garage door as a backstop. Oh, so, my gosh. And you, you stop the game to let the cars go by, and then you continue. So I played all sports. My escape was sports. Yeah. Because it was better than being there doing sports mm -hmm. than it was to be um, dad's punching bag. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and I followed, I followed that and I found that locker room experience with those guys because we would play sports, but we would also be outside and just hang out. And yeah. that was back in the day when you stayed outside until the street lights came on. Yeah, you street knew lights when came you on, had to go that home. Was, that was when you had to be back in the house. So. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. So you played sports, all sports. You graduated from high school. Yes. And went to college? I did go to college. I went to Boston College. To Boston College. Yeah. I mean, I went to Boston College on a football scholarship. Okay. I played um, football at high in high school and was recruited. I was I won't say I was heavily recruited, but I was recruited pretty much nationwide. Yeah. And I wanted to stay local in Boston because at that point, like I said, I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. I thought I wanted to be a priest. And I knew the program at Boston College would help me get there. Yeah, you wanted to be a priest. Yeah. And so what made you choose to want to be a priest? Um, I was in love with the church. Okay. And I, I say the church because I had not discovered that true relationship yet. The Jesus. The like Jesus, the, re, the Jesus God relationship. Yeah. But I was in love with the church. Okay. And I felt that I could make a difference there. And it was also, I was running, I ran so hard from my dad that I wanted to do everything that he didn't want me to do. So if yeah. he didn't want me to do it, gosh, I was going to do it. Wow. So he did, he wanted me to play basketball. And I was tall. I was, yeah. I was very athletic. He wanted me to play basketball. And I, the last thing I wanted to do was touch a basketball. Yeah. I'd play any other sport. Yeah. I would play field hockey, but I would not <laughs> play basketball. You would not play basketball because he wanted you to. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So. so you played football instead I did. at Boston College. At Boston College, yeah. Okay. Um, did your did your football career end there? No, I um, I actually was I was good enough at the sport that I played at the next level. I played at the highest level. That's awesome. I played two years in the NFL. That's so. awesome. Yeah. And then um, at some point in here, you got married. Is that right? No, I got married, got married a little after. later. You little got married. Later, yeah. So talk to me about um, talk to me about not being a part of the NFL anymore, like that process, and uh, take me to when you got married and met your. Um, met your wife. Well, as an athlete, um, it's very very difficult to transition out of the athletic phase into life a life phase. Yeah. Especially in my marriage, I yeah. discovered real early in my marriage. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't play football in your marriage. Yeah. If football is a game that's played on the field with big men, yeah. big, big boys, <laughs> yeah. actually. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Tracy and I did not always have the best mm. uh, marriage together. We have since become best friends. Yeah. We talk about everything and anything. And there's not a there's not a subject we can't talk about together. So while you're not married, yes. you guys are best friends. Yes, we and are. You have a child. We have a son, Luke. Well, I mean, he's not a child anymore. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's my son is 27. Okay, lives in Indiana. He's an, a Luke is an in, he lives in Indiana and he is a engineer, That's civil amazing. engineer. 
That's and awesome. He's doing really, really well. Has the Midas touch in life. That's amazing. If he touches it, it usually turns out pretty good. That's awesome. So talk to me about, because right now we're sitting in a studio in Boise, Idaho, and that we're not near Boston. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, you said you had lived in Boston, you know, through college yeah. years and everything. Somehow you made it to Idaho. Um, tell me about that. Well, um, in my football dealings, I worked my way west. Okay. And we settled in California at, at one point. Mm -hmm. And it became the realization came that football was no more, so I was done with that. So Tracy had an opportunity to take work here in Idaho. Okay. So we came to Idaho in the late 90s. Okay. Um, when I came from, from California, I had lived in Boston, I had lived in New York, I had lived in Phoenix, and I had lived in L.A. Oh, my gosh. And I came to Idaho, and I'm like, this, is, very the, different. this is the capital, and... <laughs> So where's the city? Yeah. So the, the, where's the city if this is the capital? Yeah. And it was and it was much smaller than it is now. Oh in yeah. Ninety eight. It was just it was tiny. It was a tiny little yeah. thing. Well yeah. I mean New York, Boston, California, Phoenix. I mean I think Phoenix is the second largest city in the yeah. United States or something crazy like that. Yeah. It's, wow. Yeah. I was I was looking for the city and it took me a good two years mm -hmm. to get used to. The different pace yeah. in life that Idaho lives. Yeah. I mean, it was growing up in the city. Yeah. If you weren't running at 6 a.m. when you first run, got up, you were going to miss the day. You were going to get run over. Wow. So that was your pace of life. Yes. That was just your mentality. Mm -hmm. Have you slowed down a little since? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, lo I love it here. Yeah. Although Idaho is rapidly changing. Yeah, it's true. Um, I still like that the, the pace is at, at least controllable. You can control your pace here. You don't have to be moving with the mass. Yeah. So. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about your faith journey. Um, because you said you grew up Catholic and you wanted to be a priest. Well, you did not become a priest. No. Spoiler alert. <laughs> you yes. did not become a priest. You right. got married, right. <laughs> um, had a kid. Um, where, when did you decide, okay, obviously priesthood is not for me. Um, but when did you find like this a deep relationship with Jesus? It was a it was a long journey. Um, even though I remained Catholic, I was like I said in love with the church. Yeah, I still had not discovered that relationship. Which we can make an idol. I mean, church. Absolutely. We can make an idol if it's about. I mean, it feels like it could be hard to make an idol, but if it's above Jesus or we don't have that relationship, it can also be dangerous. I was surrounded by athletes that had come from different areas of the country, mm -hmm. so and they had a relationship. Wow. And I, disc I saw that in them, and I was always, how do I get that? How yeah. do I get that relationship? From other athletes. Yeah, they, That's they, awesome. They didn't, they didn't lead with, um, I'm Catholic or yeah. I'm Baptist. They didn't, right. they just led with I'm a Christian and yeah. I love Jesus and I wanted that. Mm. So it took me a while to get fully immersed in that because I didn't want to let go of my church roots. Yeah. So um, for probably 20 years or so, I kind of had one foot still in the church and one foot learning about a relationship with Jesus. Okay. And then in the early 2000s here in Idaho. Okay. Um, Tracy and I decided that our, our marriage was not working, so we, we separated and split and got divorced. Um, and the church was very anti mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. So it forced me to find a different, different aven avenue to stay in a church. Yeah. So I discovered the, what we call the non-denominational yeah. church. Yeah. So... Very reluctantly, I continued to go because it was, I, I missed the ceremony of, yeah. of a Catholic service. Yeah, like the so, liturgy of yes, like all it, of it the was, things. I mean, it, it's like sit, stand, kneel, sit, stand, <laughs> kneel, say yeah. this prayer. Like, and, but, and there was, wasn't that. Yeah. And it's different. One of the things I had to get used to was the music was different. Mm -hmm. Gosh, the, it was like a little mini rock concert <laughs> at the beginning of most service. So, do you like uh, that now or no? Um, I don't like the super loud. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm okay with um, the uh, popular songs that are on the radio that I know. Yeah. But the super loud. Do you gets, like hymns? 
Yes, uh, on him. a little bit. Yeah. Some like the old, some of them. Yeah. Sometimes I, I'm, I don't feel the connection that I used yeah. to have with that. Okay. So, um, and so I went to a, a church here in Boise, and um, I also decided to be baptized at that point because in in my Catholic faith we had a sprinkle baptism right. when I was too young to even know what was going on. Right. So I didn't make that. Cho- so as an adult, I decided, well, I'll make that choice and I'll be baptized. That's awesome. And I feel it was it was a light bulb moment. Mm-hmm. I went in that water and I came out a totally different human being. I was not Scott McMenamin as the as we knew it anymore. Yeah. Um, and from that experience, I've been on this mission to serve men. Yeah. To serve. I want the locker room experience yeah. with guys. I want them in to know that Jesus can be in our locker room. He well, really can be in our locker room. Absolutely. And it's how, I mean, it's how you kind of saw this relationship with Jesus, that it can, it's a thing that you and Jesus can have yeah. through other athletes and through seeing that, you know, in sports and having those locker room experiences. Like that can be a really great, encouraging thing. And men need that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because we... We put our heart and soul on the field, yeah. but what, what do we do? One, I mean, a game is only four-hour window yeah. during, in, in the game of football, it's a four-hour window in a week. You yeah. don't play multiple games in a week, and what do you do with the rest of the time? Mm-hmm. So where do you where do you have that outlet? And men, we're very silent with our mm-hmm. pain, with our past, with our our broken dreams. Yep. If we have broken dreams in our life, we we're real silent about it, and we carry that burden. Mm-hmm. So to be able to have other guys help you shoulder that was what I felt God was pushing me to. You are to help other guys shoulder their burdens. Yeah. So Men have a reputation of being very stoic and just very like, I'm not going to feel this. I'm just going to stuff it or put it over here because I just have to keep moving, right? We just have to keep going. And you guys carry a lot. And especially if you have kids or you have, you know, a past or if you're married or whatever, like you carry so many things. And I think it's um, a natural tendency for men, because I watch my husband do it, um, to just carry things through life and just keep mm-hmm. keep piling things on, right? But then where do you go with that? Men need other men to be vulnerable and that it's okay to share brokenness, broken dreams, hardships, heartache, grief, whatever it is. So that's amazing because it's so needed. And it's like we put it, we start with a small trailer and mm-hmm. we just put the, <laughs> the bags in the small trailer and then mm-hmm. the trailer gets full. So then we upgrade to a van. Yeah. And then the van gets full, so we upgrade to a little a little truck. Yeah. And we eventually we're pulling a big truck yeah. full of stuff yeah. that we don't have to carry anymore. We yeah. can we have to learn to let that go. So through trial and error and through a lot of therapy, <laughs> I was able to understand that you can let those things go. Yeah. You can just let them go. And that's the mission I'm on now is to help men understand that you don't have to do it alone. Mhm. And we can let things go. Yeah. We really can let things go. I love that. That's awesome. Well, I know you lead men's ministry at our church where we go, and I know that it is so helpful and so encouraging. And that's actually one of the things I love about our church is the focus on men's ministry. We do have women's ministry, and we do have, and a lot of churches do, but um, I have never seen really such a thriving men's ministry, especially because our church isn't a mega church, you know, um, but to have such a thriving men's ministry because having strong men in a church is so important. Mm. So um, I just love what you're doing. It's an interesting fact how I got to that point in my journey. Uh, In 2012, Mm -hmm. my son was playing high school hockey back in New England. His mom and my son had moved back to New England to play, and he's playing high school hockey. And his Mm -hmm. hockey career was going to take him to the college level. So I moved back to New England for six years in 2012 through 2018 and in 2018 Luke and I had a conversation he said dad I'm going to continue my work career in Indiana Mm. um why don't you go back to Idaho that Idaho is where you want to be go back there yeah so he um 
I won't say gave me permission, but I came back to Idaho. And I was kind of lost when I first came back because Idaho had changed so much yeah, in yeah. the six years I was gone. Gosh, it had grown so big. And yeah, it was, from t- we moved here yeah. in 2012. So you yeah. left in 12 yeah. and came back in 18, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, it, it was... It, I like to say sometimes it Boise wasn't Boise anymore, no, but I've no. rediscovered that yeah. part of it. Um, and I met I met a pastor, Justin, mm-hmm. and Justin said, "There's a purpose for you here mm. in Idaho." And I'm like, "I don't know about that. I want to. Reti- <laughs> I'm going to retire to Florida. I'm gonna just, Sounds like a great place. Yeah, I'm just going to retire to Florida. And um, the friend that I was going to retire to Florida with had heart surgery and he was taken home. So Mm. God took him home. So I'm like, oh, well, I don't have my best friend to move to Florida with anymore. And the property I had bought decided to get blown off the beach during the hurricane. Oh my gosh. The Lord was was like... God was sending me these signs in a roundabout way. Oh man. So, um, I listened to Justin and I, and, uh, we have a very vibrant men's ministry. It's, um, yeah. Men come from other churches and tell us, gosh, you guys, you guys do men right. Yeah, that's true. So and we, we have a monthly men's breakfast. We have several men's groups that you meet. Um, and we're, we have a men's retreat in the winter. Yeah. And hopefully next year we'll have a winter and a summer version of that retreat. So That's awesome. Yeah, we're, we're growing. So, so th- that church is Real Life Ministries, and yeah. I will, in the show notes of this podcast, I will put that down there in case there is a man that's like, man, I need to get connected to a men's ministry, or I need that, um, so somebody can reach out. Yeah, and, and uh, you can put my email, okay. and I will gladly follow up. I would say put my phone number, but that could no, we'll that may get email. that may get weird. Yeah, we'll do so, email. So yeah, let's do email, and um, yeah, yeah, and I'd be glad to talk to any man that needs to find the next step. If that next step is a men's group or the next, or come to our men's breakfast. Yeah. I mean. I hear they're fun. (laughs) Asher and I share things that, uh, share at men's breakfast that just blow me away. Yeah. I I think he told, he shared his story with his son Mm -hmm. at the retreat. Yeah. Which made me, that's what made me follow up with him. Yeah. Uh, And and, uh, yeah, like you said, like you said earlier, we are building an incredible friendship. I mean, I'm, very connected to your family. Love yeah. going to your son's ball games. And yeah. Well, just, you've become a very special person in our family, too, very quickly. I so. appreciate that. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, I want to address something. So um, when I first asked you to do this podcast, you were super hesitant. Is that right? Yes. In the beginning, you were like, mm, I'm going to have to think about it. You didn't yeah. You didn't really yeah. know. Yeah. And I, I, what you shared with me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what you shared with me is, Part of why you were really hesitant, didn't know if you wanted to be on the podcast, is because you were you were struggling a little bit with um, feeling worthy or qualified enough to share your story. Is that right? Yeah, I didn't I didn't feel that my story mattered. Like it, yeah. it's something that I lived, but why would that? Why would anyone want to hear that? What I mean, I did, didn't do anything spectacular, super incredible, mm-hmm. um, and I didn't feel worthy that. Um, I could help people. Yeah. And I struggle. I still struggle with that. That's why (laughs) it's so hard for me. It's so awesome for me to continue to work with men because when I see something happen in their life, oh, it feels so good. Right? It feels so good. Well, and then it's just the power of sharing our stories and being able to just relate to people. And so that's why we had a conversation and I was like, man, that's just not true. Like you do have a story as big or small as you think that it is. Like it's a story that God's writing on your life and people need to hear it, men, women, like, but I definitely think men need to be connected to you and people like you, you know? Um, and so anyways, you're here, you decided to come on the podcast. I'm super thankful for that, but I always end the podcast asking you to tell the listener something, some piece of encouragement. And, um, what would you tell a listener, man or woman that is struggling with feeling like their story doesn't matter? Like they're not equipped or qualified or worthy enough to share their story. Cause what, what does somebody care? Okay. Well, the first thing I would say is your story does matter. Yeah. It absolutely matters. Yeah. Uh, You wouldn't be in this position if it didn't matter and God didn't somehow cradle you through Mm -hmm. the stuff to get you to this point. Don't do it alone. Yeah. Do not do it alone. Find somebody to help you carry the burden Mm -hmm. or carry, even sometimes carry the joys. Yeah. 
Um, it's true. So just find somebody else. And if that's not in a church, find that in a group, mm-hmm. in a small group or whatever type of group. But find other people to do it with. Mm-hmm. Life is so much grander when we do it with other people. Yeah. And God's called us in the community. To, yeah. We're not supposed to do this alone, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for being here. I appreciate it. I appreciate you, and I appreciate your story and your willingness to come share. Well, I appreciate I appreciate you understanding that I was a little reluctant, and here I am. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation on the Stories Unveiled podcast. We would love it if you would leave us a rating or a review. If you would like to learn more about Stories Unveiled and our events, go to storiesunveiledconference.com or follow us on Facebook or Instagram at storiesunveiled underscore. The Stories Unveiled podcast is created in partnership with KTSY and Barefoot Media Ministries. For more encouragement and other podcasts, visit ktsy.org. Have an incredible day and go live unveiled.